Chapter 2 A hush fell over our cluster of freshmen, cloaking us with that same sense of dread that ancient civilizations must have felt during a solar eclipse. But we weren't awestruck by a dragon eating the sun. We were facing a much less mythical danger. Older kids. An army of giants. I'd just spent a year in 8th grade towering over the 6th and 7th graders. Okay, that was an exaggeration. I only towered over the short ones. But I wasn't used to being at the bottom of the food chain, or the wrong end of a growth spurt. I felt like the towel boy for the Sixers. As the loud, joking, shoving mob reached us, I slipped toward the back of the group and pretended to adjust my watch. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a kid kneel to tie his shoe. That earned him a kick in the rear from a member of the mob as it passed. Mouth kept talking. Big mistake. The giants closed in on him, dumped the contents of his backpack onto the sidewalk, and threw his hat down a storm drain. Hey, come on, guys, Mouth said as his possessions spilled across the concrete. Hey, come on, hey, stop it, come on, that's not funny. We're all classmates, right? We all go to the same school. Let's be friends. The scary thing was that the big kids didn't seem angry. I'm pretty sure they trashed his stuff by reflex, like they were scratching an itch or squashing a bug. Some people step on ants, some people step on freshmen. I guess it was better to be a freshman than an ant. At least the seniors didn't have giant magnifying glasses. Mouth was spared from further damage by the arrival of transportation. With an ear-killing squeal of brakes, the bus skidded to the curb, bathing us in the thick aroma of diesel fuel, motor oil, and a faint whiff of cooked antifreeze. The driver opened the door and glared at Mouth as the mob pushed their way aboard. Pick up that mess, kid! he shouted. When I walked past Mouth, I thought about giving him a hand. You're holding us up! the driver shouted. He kept his glare aimed in my direction while he took a gulp of coffee from a grimy thermos cup. Great. Of all the types of bus drivers in the world, I had to get a shouter. I hurried on board, hoping to grab a seat near Julia. No such luck. As dangerous as the bus stop is, at least there are places to run. There's no escape from the bus. It's like a traveling version of a war game. All that's missing are the paintball guns and maybe a couple of foxholes. I could swear one of the kids in the back was in his 20s. I think he was shaving. I sat up front. That wasn't much better, since every big kid who got on at the rest of the stops had a chance to smack my head. I should have grabbed a seat behind Sheldon Murmblower. There was something about his head that attracted swats. Everyone within two or three rows of him was pretty safe. For the moment, all I could do was try to learn invisibility. I opened my backpack and searched for something to keep me busy. Now I really wish I'd brought that field guide or anything else to read. All I had was blank notebooks, pens, and pencils. I grabbed a notebook. The driver was shouting at a new batch of kids as they got on. Then he shouted at Mouth, who was sitting in the front seat. Shut up, kid! You're distracting me! Last year was so much better. I had the greatest driver, Louie. He used to drive a city bus. That gave me an idea. I started writing. It didn't cut down on the snacks as much as I'd hoped, but it did keep my mind off them. Scott Hudson's Field Guide to School Bus Drivers Retired city bus driver. Unbelievably skilled. Can fit the bus through the narrowest opening. Never hits anything by accident, but might bump a slow-moving car on purpose. Spits out the window a lot. Never looks in the mirror to check on us. Knows all the best swear words. Ex-hippie, or child of hippies. Has a ponytail, smiles too much, uses words like groovy. Likes to weave back and forth between the lanes in time to Grateful Dead music. Wears loose, colorful clothing. Smells like incense. Refuses to believe it's the 21st century. College student. Similar to the hippie, but no ponytail. Hits stuff once in a while. Studies for exams while driving. Sometimes takes naps at red lights or does his homework while steering with his knees. Beginner. Very nervous. Goes slowly. Can't get out of first gear, but still manages to hit stuff pretty often. Makes all kinds of cool sounds when frightened. Occasionally shuts eyes. Shouter. Very loud. Goes fast, slams the door. Likes country music, NASCAR, and black coffee. 
Hands tend to shake when they're not clutching the wheel. Often has broken blood vessels and eyes. Usually needs a shave. Always needs a shower. 20 minutes and one full page later, we reach, reach J.P. Zenger High. No pushing, the driver shouted as we scrambled out. High school, Mouth said, staggering to the side as someone pushed him out, out of the way. Here we come. This is going to be great. We're going to rule this place. Wrong, Mouth. Wrong, 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 wrong. There were so many buses that the parking lot smelled like a truck stop. On top of that, the lot was jammed with a long line of parents dropping off kids and a wave of seniors driving their own cars with varying degrees of skill. I stood on the curb for a moment, my eyes wide and my head tilted back. I'd seen it a thousand times before, but I'd never really looked at it. Zinger High was huge. It sprawled out like a hotel that had a desperate desire to become an octopus. Every couple of years, the town built another addition. The school mascot should have been a bulldozer. My homeroom was located as far as possible from the bus area. I got lost twice. The first time I asked some older kid for directions and he sent me off to what turned out to be the furnace room. I assumed this was an example of upperclassman humor. The janitor, who I'd awakened from a nap, yelled at me. I reached my desk just before the late bell rang. I didn't see a single familiar face in homeroom. The teacher passed out blank assignment books, then he gave us our schedules. I scanned mine, hoping to get at least a clue about what lay ahead. First period, honors English, Mr. Franca. Second period, gym or study hall, Mr. Cravuto, staff. Third period, art with Ms. Sta Sav Savage. Fourth period, lunch. Fifth period, uh, CP history with Mr. Ferragamo. Sixth period, CP algebra with Ms. Flutemeyer. Seventh period, life skills with Ms. Pell. Eighth period, CP Spanish with Ms. de Gaulle. Ninth period, CP chemistry with Ms. Balmer. I had no idea what the H or the CP stood for. Since there was no teacher listed for lunch, I grabbed a pen and wrote Mr. E. Meat. My first class turned out to be as far as possible from homeroom and nearly impossible to find. But at least I knew enough not to ask for directions. Ten minutes into my freshman year and already I'd learned an important lesson. When I reached the room, I finally saw a face I recognized. The same face I hadn't recognized earlier. Julia was in my English class, along with Kelly and a couple other kids I knew. Still no sign of Kyle, Patrick, or Mitch. I grabbed a seat two rows away from Julia. Things were looking up. Welcome to Honors English, Mr. Franca said. He was a short guy with a beard and sideburns and the sort of rugged face you see on the cable hunting shows. Instead of a camouflage outfit, he was wearing a light blue button-down shirt with the sleeves rolled up but no tie or jacket. I hope you all love to read. He grabbed a stack of pa paperbacks from his desk and started tossing them out like literary frisbees. I noticed a marine tattoo on his left forearm. He also passed out a textbook, which weighed about nine pounds. Fortunately, he didn't toss it. Otherwise, there'd probably have been a death or two in the back row. <clears throat> Instead of reading in class, we started discussing how to define a short story. It was actually fun. I didn't say too much. I didn't want anyone to think I was some kind of brain, which I'm not. I wasn't even sure how I'd ended up in the honors class. Maybe it was because of the tests we'd taken at the end of last year? Mr. Franca kept asking us all sorts of questions to keep the discussion going. At one point, he said... What do you think is easier to write, a short story or a novel? I almost raised my hand. I'd read so many of both, I figured I had a good answer. A story was harder, because you couldn't wander around. You had to stick to the subject, at least in a good story. It was a matter of focus. <clears throat> Most of the kids said that a novel would be harder because it was longer. I wasn't sure whether to speak up or just keep quiet. Then Julia raised her hand. I think stories are harder. She said, in a novel, the writer can wander. In a story, the writer has to stay focused. Right! Oh, great. I hadn't meant to shout. But it was so amazing to find that we felt the same way. Everyone was looking at me. I agree, I said in a quieter voice as I slunk down in my seat. Wonderful. Now she'd think I was some kind of suck-up. 
At the end of the period, Mr. Franca wrote our homework on the board and passed out a vocabulary book. One class, three books. This was not a good sign. There was a dash for the door when the bell rang. The hall was jammed with freshmen walking in circles, ellipses, zigzags, and other patterns that marked us as, cl marked us as clueless members of the lost generation. Or lost members of the clueless generation. I saw Patrick in study hall, but the teacher wouldn't let us talk. For some reason, he thought we should be studying. We made color charts in art class, which was pretty interesting. On the way out, Mrs. Ms. Savich gave us a photocopy of an article about Van Gogh. I was beginning to calculate my reading load by the pound instead of the page, but that was okay. I could handle it. 